Hello and welcome to the Ophthalmic Edge. We're going to be speaking about endoscopy today, ophthalmic endoscopy in vitreoretinal retinal surgery. The history of endoscopy dates back to the times of Harvey Thorpe, the 1930s, specifically 1934, when Dr. Thorpe, who was interested in intraocular foreign bodies, developed a fixed lens scope for intraocular foreign body extraction. The scope was quite large. It was larger than 5 millimeters in diameter, and it was a direct imaging scope, so the surgeon had to lean over from the operating table to look directly into the globe. The associated instruments that were used for extraction were rather large, being approximately the same size, and claw-like in shape, with a variety of end tips to remove foreign bodies. It wasn't very successful, although it was a start. It fell out of interest for a long period of time, and then there was a resurgence in the 1990s with the development of new techniques in endoscopy. During this time, it was looked upon as an adjunct to vitreoretinal retinal surgery where there was limited or loss of microscopic viewing during the regular vitreoretinal retinal surgery. There were two types of scopes that were developed during the time. One was a GRIN scope, a gradient index of refraction scope, which is basically a glass rod with a closely attached camera. This scope was quite large, about the size of a FACO handpiece, but it produced a beautiful image with a limited amount of peripheral view. You had to be quite close, but the image quality was superior. The second type of scope was called the fused fiber scope, which used pixelized glass poles in 10 to 30,000 pixel segments to produce the image. The image quality wasn't quite as good as a glass rod, but it allowed you to have an instrument that was much more familiar to the operating surgeon in that it looked like an endoilluminator. Its size is about approximately 0.89 millimeters or 20 gauge and recently smaller. The advantages of endoscopy could be summarized in the following list. It was an alternate viewing method. It allowed for small gauge work. There was a working channel usually with laser or endocautery in many of the scopes, and it permitted a second hand for manipulation if you use the scope as your major imaging technique. Obviously, the disadvantages were that it was a monocular view. A high-resolution monitor had to be used, which means the surgeon had to watch a monitor rather than a microscope, something that he was not used to. The image had to be well-registered, and there was a long learning curve for some surgeons and the operating room team. Currently, the endoscope is used for endophotocoagulation of the ciliary body, predominantly by anterior segment surgeons, for the control of intraocular pressure when it is used. In vitreoretinal retinal surgery, it was used almost exclusively for limited or absent microscopic views. The learning curve was simple. There were usually three levels of it that I would use. The first was simple viewing meaning that the endoscope was used to look at the optic nerve head, to look at the macula, when you couldn't use a microscope, trying to decide whether or not further surgery was necessary or any other procedure necessary to obtain, again, microscopic viewing. The second level, more difficult than the first, was use of the endoscope along with an integrated 810 laser. You would approach whatever you wish to laser slowly and apply applications in a similar fashion to the use of laser for any form of in vitro retinal surgery, and then watch for the reaction. The third level, which is by far more difficult, was learning to use the endoscopic image while controlling a second instrument using your other hand. This is usually done first some distance from the retina, like with a lighted laser probe. Here the light would be large enough and cone-like enough so that you could see the approach of the laser during your endoscopic viewing the cone would become smaller as you approach the surface of the retina in a similar fashion that a flashlight cone of light gets smaller as you approach a wall. And then the last and most difficult form of endoscopic second-hand control would be that of work on the surface of the retina with forceps or scissors or an air fluid exchange device. Usually, I tell people that it's a good idea to begin in a laboratory, and I think each person should have a good machine in service by the manufacturer. It's a wise idea to have setup, sterilization review, and storage, especially storage of the endoscopic probe, 
provided by the manufacturer so that you know exactly what the manufacturer wants you to do to maintain whatever warranty you might have on the instrument. Then I usually ask people to practice in an eye bag situation just to get an idea of what registration is like and how they can use a second hand to perform the procedures we've discussed already. Finally, when you begin in an operating room suite, it's a good idea to use the light source of the endoscope as a viewing mechanism as well as a light source so that your second hand can control a lighted laser probe. And this gives you use of both the microscope in a clear media situation as well as the endoscope, being able to switch back and forth as you accomplish your learning curve, learning to establish the distance that you are from the surface of the retina by looking through the microscope first and then leaning back and looking at the monitor without changing your hand positions. This coordination becomes very useful when you cannot see inside the eye at all. We also have to figure out how to start to do this technique. I usually decide which kind of a view I wish, since the endoscope can provide approximately 180 degrees of view, or maybe slightly more without twisting or torquing too much on the scleral surface. I decide when I begin, or when I think I'm going to be using the scope, from which side of the eye I should enter. Remember, the port will be slightly open in the sclera, more than 20 to admit the 20-gauge size endoscope. I choose either a nasal entry site to view the temporal aspect of the globe or a temporal aspect to view the nasal side. I check the scleral opening to be sure it will admit the 20 gauge size with a little bit of room and I usually put a little bit of helon on the shaft but not on the tip of the endoscope to admit the probe more easily. I then register the image by positioning my hand next to the patient's brow in a comfortable place so that I know that if I place the endoscope in, I'm not going to have to rotate it too much. And then I'll usually ask the scrub nurse to place a written piece of material on the forehead so that I can focus the scope and read it, quote unquote, off of the monitor. If I can read left to right, then I know I have good registration. and I'm going to maintain without twisting the scope that position as I enter the globe. I will then focus posteriorly to see what's going on in the posterior portion of the eye and get a good view as I can of the optic nerve and macula, being certain that the monitor view is the same as the microscopic view and that movements are similar to an XY device on a microscope, meaning that as I move the endoscope towards 6 o'clock, I see more and more of the 6 o'clock position, just like you would with a microscope. If the tip is clean, I don't have to bother cleaning the scope. And if the connection to the device has no dust on it, you are ready to go. So viewing the posterior pole and the disc and the macula is the beginning and then rotating or moving, I should say, not rotating, moving the scope inferiorly left and right will allow you to see the lower portion of the eye. You may have to torque the scope slightly but you have to be gentle as you do it and usually retracting the scope slightly. Whether or not the patient is pseudophagic or not will determine how far forward you can come without shanking the lens if one is in place. The second step is learning how to use the integrated laser, and usually this is done by a slow approach, watching for the treatment reaction the same way we would with any laser. It's really fairly straightforward. Beginning with a second instrument in the opposite hand starts another whole level of endoscopy. I have learned that it is a good idea to put a lighted instrument in the eye whenever you use it, at least at the beginning until you learn perspective in monocular viewing. A lighted laser probe is easily manufactured and available. I have air fluid candles that have small lights that have been placed on them. Scissors and forceps can be purchased with lights on them as well. And I think they're very useful, at least in the beginning, until you achieve the ability to rapidly approach the area that you wish by watching the cone of light on your second instrument get smaller so that you know your depth. Moving around the globe is a little fussy. You must learn to move a lighted instrument before you move your image. If you move your instrument too fast, you'll go outside the view of 120 degrees, and then you'll lose the position of where your second instrument is located. If this does happen, it's always easier to pull out and start all over again with proper positioning and movement. And once you learn this technique, it becomes pretty easy to move around the globe, moving the lighted instrument first from one side to another of your image and then moving your scope, kind of like stepwise fashion around the globe. Monocular depth clues include shadowing, superimposition, size change as you approach, things get larger, 
They're all learned almost secondarily. I mean, it is amazing how quickly you adapt, especially when you have no view through a microscope and you do have a view through an endoscope. There is a new endoscope, a 23-gauge scope, which is available from one manufacturer. But this is a shorter scope because the longer scopes produced a great deal of problems with rigidity. There was too much flexibility. The field is narrower. The instrument itself is less rigid, and they've had to build up the base at the area where it goes through the sclera so the torquing wouldn't break it. I don't recommend the scope, especially through cannulas, until you are familiar with endoscopy with a 20-gauge system. I just think it's too much to ask and too delicate. But I think it is the future, and we will be moving to smaller scopes as people become used to the technique. One last point. Endoscopy is an adjunct. Mastering the learning curve in clear media before you require the technique for a limited or no-view microscopic situation is important, very important. I've seen so many people try to start using endoscopy when they have never used it before in a situation where I myself might find it quite difficult, and I've been doing endoscopy for over 15 years. I find it very, very helpful and you adapt to it very quickly. But this staged or stepwise approach is the best way that I have found to improve your technique in vitreal retinal surgery, increasing your view for the use of an ocular fused fiber endoscope.